Let's practice applying our understanding of equations, linear equations, and inequalities together. Now, while you can totally sit back and watch me go over these particular practice problems, I also encourage you to grab some paper, something to write with, and we can also do some math together. Let's jump right into it. For number one, we have this one step equation and it looks like we're gonna be solving for h. Now what's happening on the same side as h, it looks like we are taking away 5.8. So the opposite of taking away 5.8 is gonna be adding. So first thing I'm gonna do is just write down the equation h minus this 5.8, that's gonna be equal to this negative 5.6, all right? Now if we wanna get h alone, the goal here is to get zero. So let's go ahead and use the addition property of equality and add 5.8 to both sides of this equation. If we go ahead and do that, then on the left side, uh, negative 5.8 plus 5.8 is gonna be zero. So we're gonna get h plus zero. And on the right side, we have negative 5.6 plus 5.8. So that's a negative plus a positive. So in that case, we're gonna actually subtract them. So we're gonna take the number with the greater absolute value, take away the number with the smaller absolute value. So 5.8 minus 5.6 is going to be 0.2 here, all right? So it looks like we're gonna have a positive 0.2. And so we can go ahead and use the identity property and say that H is going to be equal to positive 0.2. So that would be the solution to this first equation. All right, here's number two. If you look at number two, it looks like we have another one step equation. In this case though, the variable we're looking for K is on the right side of the equation. So I'm gonna just copy down this equation. 56 is equal to negative four multiplied by something or this K value, right? Now, what we're gonna do here to get K alone is the goal is to get one uh, or coefficient of one rather. So we can do that by dividing the right side by negative four. And this is the division property of equality when we divide both sides of the equation by the same number. All right. Now, if we do that on the right side of the equation, this negative four divided by negative four is going to cancel out to just be a positive one. So that's just going to be one K, which is the goal. And then on the left side here, if we take this 56 and divide by this negative four, then we could take 56 and divide it by that four here. That's going to go in one time. One times four is four. We can subtract the remainder is one, bring down the six. So four goes in the 16 four times. So it looks like this is going to be 14 but it's gonna be a negative 14 because it's a positive divided by a negative. And then so altogether we can use identity property and just say K is equal to negative 14. All right, that would be the solution to this equation. Uh, for number three, we have another one step equation. This time we're gonna be solving for M and it looks like M is on the right side of the equation, but we're gonna go ahead and just solve it the same way we did with the others. So negative 14.5 is equal to M plus this 29.7. So if we wanna find out what M is, we need to get it alone. So we need to get zero next to it. So we can go ahead and use the subtraction property of equality and take away 29.7 on both sides of the equation, all right? So using the subtraction property of equality, notice that we're gonna end up with just M plus zero on the right side. And on the left side, it looks like we have a negative minus a negative. So this is really just gonna turn into uh, negative 14.5 minus this 29.7, right? That's the same thing as negative 14.5 plus a negative 29.7. So that's just rewriting it as an addition problem. And if we're adding two negatives, we can just know that hopefully that's gonna become more negative. So we can just add these two values together since they're both negative. So adding these, we can just line up the decimals here. Five plus seven is gonna be 12. We'll keep that decimal where it is. Carry the one here, that's gonna be 14. Carry the one, that's going to be a four. So we're looking at 44.2, and it's a negative minus a positive, or also known as a negative plus a negative. So this is negative 44.2, all right? Uh, we can also use the identity property of addition, say M equals, and write negative 44 and two tenths. So that would be our solution. All right, here is number four. For number four, we have another one-step equation. This time it looks like we have multiplication, right? So this six W means six times something or six times W is equal to this negative 197.4. So let's see, what's the inverse operation for multiplication? Well, that is going to be division. The goal here is to, gonna be to get one as a coefficient. So let's go ahead and divide both sides by six. So on the left side, six divided by six is gonna be one. So we have one W is equal to, and on the right side, we have to divide. Now it's a negative divided by a positive, so we know the answer is gonna be negative, so I'm gonna put that right away here. But for the long division here, I'm just gonna go ahead and set up and put this 197.4 and divide that by six here. So six into 19, that's gonna be three. Three times six, that's 18. We can subtract here, we're gonna be left with one, bring down the seven. 
six into 17, let's go two times. Two times six is 12. We have a remainder of five. Let's bring down this four here. And so six into 54, that's gonna be nine. Nine times six is 54 and we'll be left with nothing. So it looks like 197.4 divided by six is gonna be 32.9, but keep in mind it's gonna be negative here just because we had a negative divided by a positive. So if one W is equal to that, then that just means that W is equal to negative 32.9. That'll be our solution to this equation. For number five, we have another one step equation. We have three eighths of n or three eighths times n, and that's equal to 27. Uh, in the case where we have multiplication, uh, we want to go ahead and see if we can get the coefficient to be one. So what I'm gonna do here is divide both sides by the coefficient because three eighths divided by three eighths is just going to be one. And so if we go ahead and do that, we're gonna get one n on the left side. So I'm gonna write one n is equal to, and on the right side, we have 27 divided by 3 eighths. So 27 is 27 over 1 divided by 3 eighths. Now, if we divide fractions, where you can just rewrite this as a product and say it's 21 multiplied by the reciprocal of 3 eighths, which is 8 thirds. All right. Now, you can go ahead and multiply and then simplify after. I'm going to go ahead and cross cancel here. So the 3 and 27, their GCF is 3, so you can divide them both by 3. So you'll get 1 and 9. All right, so then nine times eight on top is going to be 72. Then one times one on bottom is one. So 72 holes is just going to be 72. So in this case, one N is equal to 72, or we can conclude that N is equal to 72, just using the identity property of multiplication. All right, one last one step equation to start with here. So for number six, we have E divided by nine or E ninths is equal to 24.3. All right, so if we want to find out what E is, then the inverse operation of dividing by nine is going to be multiplying by nine. So let's go ahead and multiply the left side by nine or nine over one. Let's multiply the right side by nine. That's using the multiplication property of equality. All right, now if we go ahead and do that, when we multiply fractions, remember we can cross cancel. So nine over nine just becomes one. So on the left side, we're going to have one E is equal to, and on the right side, we just have to multiply this 24.3 by nine. Okay, so 24.3 multiplied by nine. Well, nine times three is 27, carry the two. Nine times four is 36 plus two is 38, carry the three. Nine times two is 18 plus three is gonna be 21. So it looks like we're gonna have 218.7, 218.7. I don't think we have any negatives in this problem, so we don't have to worry about that. And using the identity property of multiplication, we can just say E is equal to 218.7 or N seven tenths. So this would be the solution to this equation. All right, let's try some other different types of problems now. So moving on to seven and eight, let's go ahead and see if we can figure out which one of these equations is gonna have the same solution as the given equation. So for number seven here, we're given this X plus 13 is equal to 30. So let's go ahead and see if we can find the solution for that. Um, let's go ahead and say, well, if X plus 13 is 30, then X must be equal to 30 take away 13. So we can go ahead and just rearrange it this way if we would like also, especially if the directions don't say that we have to use any specific properties. So 30 minus 13 is going to be 17, right? So that means X is going to equal 17. So this is the solution that we are going to be using to see if the other equations have the same solution or not, right? So if we take a look at option A right now, uh, if we take that 17 and say, okay, does that work for this equation? Well, two times 17, right? We're thinking X is 17, or we're gonna see if it is. And if we add four, well, two times 17 is going to be 34. 34 plus four is going to be 38. Now, is this gonna be equal to 30? I guess that's the question. And it's not equal to 30, right? So you can see that that is not going to work. So option A is not gonna have the same solution. Uh, for B, what I would do is maybe just go ahead and combine these like terms first. So negative 3x plus 6x, that's going to equal 3x. So you can see here that's going to be 3x or 3 times 17, and that's going to be equal to 51, right? Now, is that true? I think it is true, right? Because 3 times 17 does equal exactly 51. So I think B is going to work here. Now for letter C, what we can do is take that 17 and substitute it in. So for C here, we have four multiplied by what? Well, we think X is 17. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write 17 plus 23 in here. 
Now 17 plus 23 is 40, and four times 40, the question is, is does that equal 160, right? Well, four times four is 16, so four times 40 is 160. So that does equal, so we know this does check out, okay? Uh, for this last one here, uh, for D, if we take a look at the left side, we have 12 minus 20. Now 12 minus 20 is negative eight. And on the right side, let's go ahead and see, we have X minus 25. Well, we think X, well, we know X is supposed to be 17. So if we plug in 17 and if we take away 25, the question is, is, is 17 minus 25 also negative eight? Well, I think it is, right? Because if 25 minus 17 is positive eight, then 17 minus 25 should be negative eight. So this one also is gonna have the same solution where X does equal 17. All right, so for all these, go ahead and solve them however you would like to. Uh, there's no specifics in terms of what you need or don't need to do here. Uh, for number eight, we have 14 is equal to this y plus eight. So let's go ahead and solve this. If y plus eight is equal to 14, then that must mean that y should be equal to 14 minus eight. All right, so that's another way to think about it. So that means y should be equal to six here. So this is the solution that we know to be true for that first equation. Our goal is to see uh, which one of these choices or equations has the same solution. All right, now for A here, it looks like we have an equation where we can combine some like terms. So notice for A, we have negative four plus six, which is two. So this really simplifies down to saying y plus two is equal to five, All right? Now, if you go ahead and change this y to six, so then it would turn into six plus two. So if we go ahead and say six plus two, and the question is, does that equal five? Well, six plus two is eight, so eight doesn't equal five, so A is not gonna work here. All right, uh, for B, what we can do here is on the left side, we can change this uh, y to six, we can substitute that in. We can also go ahead and simplify or simplify this uh, right side. So negative seven plus 10 is three. So if we go ahead and uh, kind of clean this up a little bit, it's gonna be three multiplied by, and we think we're looking for where y is six. So it's gonna be six minus five. So six minus five is one, right? And then one times three is three. We said negative seven plus 10 is three on the right side. So I guess the question is, is does the left side of three equal the right side of three? And I would say yes here, three does equal three. So we know that y would be equal six for this equation as well, okay? Uh, for uh, C, for this equation, notice how we have like terms on the left side. So negative 2y take away 9y, uh, those are like terms. You can do negative 2y plus negative 9y, and that's going to be negative 11y. So that's going to be negative 11y. That's equal to, and on the right side, this is just 33 times 2, which is 66. So I guess the question is, is if we change this y to 6, uh, would it work? And I would argue that this does not work, right? Because if you say 11 or negative 11, right, multiplied by six, that's going to not equal that 66. I'm gonna go ahead and put a slash through this because it doesn't equal positive 66. It's close to being what we want, or it looks close to being what we want, but it doesn't actually work here, right? So C is not going to work. All right, for D, we have this 42 divided by three on the left side. We can clean that up. 42 divided by three is equal to 14. So we can say that's gonna be equal to 14 on the left side. And on the right side, we have four Y plus three Y. That's gonna be seven Y, but we think that Y is going to be equal to uh, six, or we need Y to equal six. So I guess the question is, is seven times six equal to 14? And seven times six is 42, so it's not 14. So it looks like we only had one answer choice that works here. All right, let's try some different types of problems now. Uh, let's go into some maybe applications, specifically looking at some geometry. For number nine, it looks like all three interior angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. So all that's saying here is if you have some sort of triangle, any triangle that you have really, uh, all three angles, the interior angles are gonna be this angle here, this angle here, and maybe this angle here. So we don't know what their angles are, but if you add up those three angles for all triangles, it'll always equal 180 degrees. We are told two of the angles. We know one is going to be 38 degrees. We know the other one's gonna be 56 degrees. It says write and solve an equation to find out the last interior angle of the triangle. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and say that one unknown one is going to be X here. So we know X degrees, right, uh, is what we're looking for. Plus we know one of the angles is 38 degrees degrees, uh, plus another angle is 56 degrees. Now we know if you add up all three of these, it should equal 180 degrees. Now let's go ahead and just combine some like terms here, right? So uh, we on the left side have this 38 and this 56. We can go ahead and combine those like terms. So X degrees plus, and then 38 plus 56 is going to be 94 degrees. 
that's going to equal 180 degrees. So you can go ahead and just take away 94 degrees, use that subtraction property of equality on both sides of the equation here. And if we do that, we're going to find that we're going to get X plus zero degrees or X plus nothing. Uh, we can go ahead and write that if you want is equal to 86 degrees. And then so X is going to equal 86 degrees. So to summarize this, we can just go ahead and say that the last angle, the last angle or the missing angle is going to be 86 degrees. Now, if you're not too sure if this is correct or not, you can go ahead and add the three angles together, right? We can take this 86 and then add it on to the 38 and 56 degrees and we should get 180. So if you want to check that, feel free to. Now, number 10 is very similar. This time it's just talking about a pentagon though. So a pentagon is going to be a shape, a polygon that has five sides. So one, two, three, and then four, and then a five. Maybe you can think of like a house shape here. Here we have one angle here. We have a second angle, a third angle, a fourth angle, and a fifth angle. So every time we have a pentagon that looks like this, all five of the angles inside will equal 540 degrees if you add them up. It looks like we're given four of the angles, right? One, two, three, and four. And so we have to find out the last angle here. So, so if we wanna go ahead and set up an equation here, the one we don't know is X degrees. Let's go ahead and add on the other ones we know, which is 18 degrees. We know this 49 degrees, this 150 degrees, and this 128 degrees. So all five of these angles we're told equals a 540 if we add them all together. All right, so notice how all of these are like terms on the left side, they're all constant terms, so we can combine those. If you go ahead and do that, we're gonna get X degrees plus, uh, the sum of these four angles is gonna be 345 degrees, and this is gonna be equal to 540 if you add them all together. We can go ahead and take away the 345 degrees that we know from both sides of this equation. So we're just gonna be left with X, right? So the, what we are looking for here. So let's go ahead and say that that's gonna be uh, X degrees plus zero degrees. And then on the right side, this uh, 540 minus the uh, 345, that's going to be 195 degrees. So we know that X degrees or the missing angle here is going to be 195 degrees. So we can just go ahead and answer that question and say that the last angle, or in this case, that fifth missing angle is going to be 195 degrees. So that'll be our missing value here that would make this all complete because we'd have all five angles of the Pentagon. All right, let's take a look at some independent and dependent variables for questions 11 through 14. Now, just to abbreviate here for the independent variable, I'm just going to go ahead and say that's going to be IV. Okay. And then for the dependent variable for each of these, let's go ahead and just abbreviate those as DV. So we can just do a little bit less writing here, but I'm just going to use these letters of IV and DV. Okay. So for number 11, the amount of E emails a teacher gets when they teach S students, I guess the question is, is does the amount of uh, emails they get depend on how many students they have, or does the number of students they have depend on how many emails they get. Now, if you're going to choose one of these, I think that the one that makes more sense is going to be if you have more students, then you're going to end up getting more emails from maybe the students and the parents or a combination of them. So the dependent variable, the emails are going to be the dependent variable here, and the emails are going to be depending on how many students here. So S is going to represent the number of students. and E is gonna represent the number of emails. All right, I'd argue that that is, the number of emails is gonna depend on the number of students more than the number of students depending on the number of emails. All right, for number 12, the average G grade on math tests when they study for H hours. So we know we're talking about the independent variable here or the dependent variable, let's go ahead and label those. And are we talking about G and H? Now, if you study, I guess, more, I guess, are you thinking if you study for more hours, does that impact your grade or does your grade impact the hours? I guess you gotta see which one depends on which one. Now, I would say that your grade is going to be the dependent variable here and it would depend on how long you maybe study for, right? I think there's gonna be a relationship there. If you spend a little bit less time studying, maybe you're not gonna feel as comfortable so H is just the number of hours. Okay. And then G is going to be maybe your uh, grade, right? So uh, something along the lines of that would be okay here. 
all right? Grade or grade on the math test. For 13, we have R, the R rate at which you can type when you practice typing for D days. So we have the independent variable and then we have the dependent variable. So for the independent variable, does the rate at which you type depend on how many days you practice or does how many days you practice depend on the rate at which you can type? Now, I would argue that if you spend more time or more days practicing typing that your rate would get faster. So I think the uh, dependent variable here is gonna be the rate at which you type and that's gonna depend on the number of days that go by, especially if you are practicing regularly, right? But with more time, you will most likely get better and faster. So D is gonna be the number of days, and then R is gonna be the rate at which you type, okay? Uh, for number 14, it looks like we have the amount of tea treats that Benny the dog gets when he does tea tricks. So this is going to be a little bit confusing because we have tea and tea. So if we're going to go ahead and maybe make this a little bit more clear, maybe we can uh, abbreviate this and say that this is going to be T1. Let's call this T2 to make this more clear because that's a little confusing, right? So let's call the amount of treats he gets T1 and let's call it the uh, number of tricks he does T2 here. So let's go ahead and see which one depends on which one. So it looks like I think that the number of tricks, would that depend on the number of treats or does the number of treats he gets depend on how many tricks? I might argue here that if Benny does more tricks, then he'll get more treats if he does them, right? As opposed to the opposite or the uh, backwards version of that, right? So I think that the number of treats, what are we calling treats here? We're saying that is going to be T1. So that's gonna be the number of treats depends on what what we're saying here it's going to depend on i'm going to call this t2 because it was a little confusing sorry about that t2 and that's going to be the number of tricks All right if he does more tricks he gets more treats if he does less tricks he's probably gonna get less treats okay all right let's move on to some other types of problems now um, we're going to go ahead and translate in 15 and 16 some of these verbal sentences into equations then we're going to solve it um, so let's see what's going on here for 15. Looks like we have 17 more than a number. More than means you're gonna be adding something on, right? So we're adding 17, it's 17 more than something. Um, and then we have this word is here. Now is is an important word in math. So is is always gonna be representing this equals in all the problems we're talking about here. So if we have 17 more than a number X, this is gonna be written as X plus 17, it's 17 more than it, and that is negative 23. Okay, so this is our one-step equation. We can use a subtraction property of equality, take away 17 from both sides here. If we do that, we get x plus zero is equal to, and a negative 23 minus 17 is the same thing as negative 23 plus negative 17. So that's another way you can think about it. And so that's gonna end up being negative 40. All right, now using the identity property of addition, you can drop the zero and just say x is equal to negative 40. So that would be our solution. For number 16, we have negative 24 is 3 tenths of this number y. So we have this word is again, so you should look at that word is and say, oh, okay, that means equals. And then we also know here that we see this uh, of some number. Now of in math is gonna represent that we are doing some sort of multiplication most, most of the time here. So we have negative 24 is equal to 3 tenths of some number. So 3 tenths multiplied by y or we can just write 3 tenths y. We can write it as a coefficient. So if we want a coefficient of y to be one here, then we need to do the inverse operation of multiplication, which will be division. So let's go ahead and divide both sides by 3 tenths, since if you divide anything by itself, you get one. So 3 tenths divided by 3 tenths here is going to be one. So we're gonna write one y. And on the left side, we have to go ahead and figure out what is this negative 24 or negative 24 over one divided by 3 tenths. Now, remember when we, when we uh, divide fractions, we go ahead and turn it into a multiplication problem. So it's negative 24 over one, you keep that, and you multiply by the reciprocal of the second fraction. So it's gonna be 10 over three. Now feel free to multiply then simplify, or you can go ahead and just cross cancel. So it'll be one and negative eight if you divide 24, negative 24 and three, both by the GCF of three. And then so negative eight times 10 is gonna be negative 80. One times one is one this is going to be negative 80. So that's what one y is equal to, so we know y is equal to negative 80. That'll be our solution. All right, here is another type of problem. So here we have some word problems. 
So for number 17, we know Ellie is going to be baking. She originally had some amount of flour, so we, that's gonna have some unknown. Um, and then she's gonna uh, use it for baking. So she's gonna be using some of the flour, so we're gonna be taking away some flour, and she's gonna have some left over. So that's gonna be what it's equal to. Let's go ahead and set up an equation here. So I'm gonna say X is going to represent here um, the amount of flour that Ellie started with. Feel free to use another variable. She's using flour, so she's using five and two thirds cups here, and she's ending up with three and three fourths cups, right? So anything where you're gaining or losing, we should be thinking addition or subtraction. And if we're finding the original of something, that should kind of be at the beginning there, right? And what she had left is three and three fourths, so that's by itself in the equation. If we wanna figure out what she had initially, let's not kind of use this five and two thirds. Let's go back in time and put it back, right? If she unused it, then let's reverse the subtraction and go ahead and put this plus sign or addition. So negative five and two thirds plus five and two thirds is gonna be zero. So let's say she used no flour, then how many cups would she have to begin with? So let's go ahead and figure out if we can add these two fractions. So I think what we're gonna have here is uh, we need some common denominators. Notice this uh, four and three are not the same denominator. So their LCD or least common uh, denominator is gonna be 12. So let's go ahead and multiply this by three and three and multiply this by four and four, right? So if we do that, we're essentially gonna get three and nine twelfths. And we're gonna go ahead and add on five and eight twelfths, right? Now, if you do this, this is fine to keep it in mixed numbers. Uh, adding is usually better than subtracting for these. You can add the whole number. So three plus five is gonna be eight. And then you can add the fraction. So nine plus eight is 17. So it's gonna be 17 twelfths. Now it's a little strange here to have an improper fraction within a mixed number here. So we can actually take the 17 twelfths and say this is going to be eight plus, and then the 17 twelfths as an mixed number is gonna be one and five twelfths. So if you add this together here, this is gonna be nine and five twelfths. All right, so that's gonna be the total amount of flour that Ellie must have started with before she used some for her baking, right? So again, the zero sim sim signifies here that this is what if she didn't use any flour. So then we can say X is equal to nine and five twelfths. And then we can conclude and say that uh, she originally, originally, had nine and five twelfths cups of flour. All right, so that would be our conclusion here for this situation. And if you want to, you can go ahead and plug that back in to see if it works, right? If you take nine and five twelfths and you just wanna double check it, then take this solution here, substitute it in for X, take away this five and two thirds and make sure that you do get this three and three fourths. All right, let's check out another one. So for 18, Kai knows that Mr. Lee likes his classroom door closed. I do. Uh, during his class, Kai has closed the door seven twelfths of the times. So of is an important word here of all the times that the door was left open. All right, so Kai has closed the door. It looks like more than half the number of times it was left open. Thank you, Kai. And if Kai closed the door 126 times, again, this is not all the times, he uh, closed the door a little bit more than half the number of times it was open. Uh, the question is, is how many times was it, was the total number of times that the door was left open, right? So that keyword of lets us know that uh, Kai has closed the door 7 twelfths of all the number of times it was open. We don't know what that is, so it's 7 twelfths times this total number. And we know that's equal to 126, right? Because Kai has closed the door 7 twelfths of all the times. Now, if we want to figure this out, we can go ahead and uh, do the inverse operation. So we want the coefficient of x to be 1. So right now it's 7 twelfths, but we can go ahead and use the division property of equality and divide both sides by 7 twelfths. 7 twelfths divided by 7 twelfths is going to be 1. So it's going to be 1x is equal to, and on the right side, we have to do this 126 and divide that by 7 twelfths. All right, now if you take 126 and divide by 7 twelfths, remember that we should multiply that 126 over 1 by the reciprocal of that second fraction, which is going to be 12 sevenths. Now, you can use your divisibility rules or you can just multiply and simplify, but seven is gonna go into 126. So if you go ahead and divide 126 by seven, 126 divided by seven is going to be 18. So I think we're gonna get 18 over one here. 
And then if we take 18 and multiply that by 12, that's gonna be 216. So this is gonna be 216 over one, which is equal to 216. So uh, the door must've been left open 216 times. So that was the total number. We know Kai had closed it 126 times, which is slightly more than half of 216. So I hope that makes sense there. So we can say it was left open a total of 216 times. That would be our conclusion here. And that should make sense if you wanna go ahead and write it as a fraction and say that if uh, Kai closed it 126 times, 126 out of 216, if you simplify that, that's exactly 7 twelfths. All right, let's check out some more problems here. All right, for questions 19 through 22, let's go ahead and determine the rate of change, the starting value, and we're gonna go ahead and write a linear equation that represents the data table. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the rate of change for this first problem. So for the rate of change here, uh, you can pick any uh, two columns here, any pair of X and Y. I'm just gonna start with the first two because I think it's a little bit uh, more straightforward. So from five to 23, it looks like it's gaining 18 here, right? Because five plus 18 is 23. And then from zero to three, it looks like that's gaining three. So let's go ahead and write plus three. So how do you find the rate of change for a linear equation? Well, to find the rate of change, we are always going to take the change in the Y value, right? So this positive 18, and then we're gonna divide it by the change of the X value. So if we go ahead and say positive 18 divided by positive three, that's gonna be positive six. So that's gonna be our positive rate of change for this particular problem, all right? Now for our starting value, that one is gonna be a little bit nicer if we can find the value of zero. So uh, if we know that where X is zero, then the Y value, that's always gonna be our starting value. So in this case, it's going to be a positive five, okay? So what's our linear equation gonna be? Well, try to keep in mind that our linear equations are in this form of Y is equal to MX plus B. So our rate of change here, that is the M we found a little bit ago. And then the starting value, that's gonna be our B value. So if we go ahead and replace our M with positive six and our B with this positive five, we can go ahead and write our linear equation and say this is gonna be Y is equal to a positive six, also known as just six multiplied by whatever x is, and then you can go ahead and add a positive five. So this would be our linear equation. And you can totally check this to make sure it works, right? So if x is zero, then six multiplied by zero is zero. Then if you add five, then you're gonna get five, which is this y value here. And maybe for good measure, if I take this nine here and I plug it in for x, then six times nine is going to be 54. 54 plus five is going to be 59, which is the y value. So this works for any combination that you have in this linear equation table. All right, let's try another one that's maybe not as easy. So here, let's go ahead and start with the rate of change again. That one you can always do no matter what. The starting value can be impacted if you can't find a zero, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, so for the rate of change, let's see, the, the rate of change here for the y's, it looks like it's going up, it's going up by six here. And then over here from the uh, eight to 12, it's looking like it's going up by four. Okay, so how do we get the rate of change? Uh, be careful, make sure you take the rate of change of the y. So positive six divided by positive four is just going to be six over four as a fraction. And six over four can simplify down to three over two. So our rate of change here is gonna be a positive three over two. All right, so for every six that it increases in the y, it's gonna change or increase four on the x. So if it increases three in the y, it's gonna increase two in the x. All right, now for the starting value, that was where we were looking for where X was zero, but notice here that we don't see that X is zero uh, for any of these. So that makes it a little bit more challenging. However, please notice here that we are decreasing by four as you go from right to left. So we can continue the pattern and we can go ahead and write a zero here and add another column to this table. And notice over here from 27 to 21, it decreases by six decreases by six, decreases by six, decreases by six. If we go six smaller than three, that's going to be negative three. So while we didn't see it right away, uh, hopefully this helps you see that sometimes you can still find where X is equal to zero. So that means that our starting value here, so we see here that X is zero, then our starting value is going to be negative three here. So that's gonna be our starting value, okay? So we know that's gonna be our M and that's gonna be our B. 
So we can write our linear equation as y is equal to, and we write our rate of change first, which is three halves, multiplied by whatever x is each time. And now we're gonna go ahead and add negative three, or we can just say minus three. It's okay to write plus negative three, it's the same thing. All right, uh, if you wanna check this, you can totally do that by just checking with any column here. So let's just say x is 20, right? If you wanna to check to make sure you got it right, take this 20 and substitute it in here, right? That would say that y is equal to three halves multiplied by 20, which is 20 over one. And if we take away three, we're gonna hopefully get 27. So you can go ahead and cross cancel the one and the 20 to make it one and 10. Three times 10 is gonna be 30. So it's gonna be y is equal to 30 minus three and 30 minus three is equal to 27, which checks out because that's what this y value is here. Feel free to check that with any of the other uh, combinations of x and y to make sure that that works out, okay? Let's try another one. In this one, it's gonna be a little bit trickier um, and you'll see why hopefully in just a moment, but we can start with the rate of change. Uh, that's gonna be uh, done first here no matter what. Uh, I'm gonna stay away from the negative numbers as you might as well maybe. So for the change of y here is gonna be two to 10, that's gonna be increasing by eight. And then from seven to three here, it looks like it's going down, so it's decreasing by four. So be careful of the signs here, all right? So how do we find the rate of change? Well, it's gonna be this uh, positive eight over a negative four. So what's positive eight divided by negative four? Well, eight divided by four is two. So eight divided by negative four must be negative two. So the rate of change here is gonna be negative. And that's always gonna be true if the x's look like they are decreasing here while the y values here are increasing. So they're doing different things. One's going up while one's going down. So we're gonna have a negative rate of change. Now the starting value is gonna be tricky here because we're looking for when x is zero. That's what we kind of looked for in the last couple problems. But look how these numbers here skip over zero uh, and it doesn't look like we can find a nice number to get there. And so that's gonna make this a little bit trickier. So here's what I recommend doing if that's the case. We know that the linear equation is supposed to be this y is equal to, and then it's gonna be the rate of change or m multiplied by x and it's gonna be plus whatever the starting value is or plus what b is. Right, so what do we know so far? Well, we know the rate of change is negative two, so it's y is equal to negative two multiplied by whatever x is, right? And we don't really know what we're adding yet, right? We're trying to figure out what the starting value is. That we don't know. But what we do know is the ending value that we're trying to get to. So what you can do is you can go ahead and take any pair that you want. Let's go ahead and use this uh, three and 10 for a moment, right? Let's just say that X is three. So if X is three here, then we would have Y is equal to negative two multiplied by three plus something. And what is this Y value we just said? We just said this Y value was gonna be 10, right? So I'm gonna say 10 is equal to and negative two times three is negative six. So what does negative six add on to so that we end up getting 10? Now I think that value is going to be 16, right? Because negative six plus 16 does equal 10, which means I think that's gonna be what our value of B is. So B here is gonna be positive 16. So I'm gonna try that one more time just to make sure that's super clear. Uh, but I think I'm gonna put a positive 16 here and say that's gonna be our starting B value. Now let's go in and just write the equation and I'll kind of go through one more example to make sure that kind of checks out there. So we have this negative two multiplied by X and then add 16. So let's see, if we didn't know that, let's go ahead and try another pair. Again, I'm gonna maybe try a negative value so you can see if it makes sense or not. But let's say we didn't know that this was 16 here, right? Let's go ahead and just take any other pair. So let's go ahead and try negative five and 26. So let's use this pair. So this is X and this is Y. So y is 26, right? We're gonna go ahead and change that to 26. We're saying x we're changing to negative five. So this is mean negative two times negative five plus this unknown that we're trying to find. Now negative two times negative five is positive 10. So we have 26 is equal to 10 plus something, right? So maybe this is nicer because we have positive numbers here. So 10 plus what number is 26? And I think that's gonna be 16 again, right? So notice how it's gonna be the same no matter what combination you use here. So if you're trying to find the B value or the starting value and you can't see a zero or can't get a zero, there's always a way around it. Just use the information that you have in the table. So I'm gonna go ahead and write back in here that we have this 16. 
All right, for number 22, let's go ahead and try another one of these. Uh, let's see, um, let's start with the rate of change. I'm gonna start and let's go ahead and use these ones here, practice using maybe some negative. So from two to six, it's increasing by four, right? And then from negative three to positive three, that's increasing by six. So it's going up six here. So what's the rate of change here? Well, it's the change of y divided by the change of x. So it's gonna be positive four divided by positive six and a positive divided by positive is still positive, right? So it's just gonna be four over six and four over six will simplify down to two over three. So it's gonna be a positive two thirds. And again, it's positive here and it makes sense because as the x's are increasing here, the y values are also increasing. So if they're both increasing, we should get a positive rate of change. Now for the starting value, I don't see the value of zero anywhere for X and it looks like it skips over, right? It goes from a negative to a positive. So that can be a little bit tricky here. Um, there's a few different ways to go around this, but I'm just gonna stay consistent with what I kind of did in the last example. So Y is equal to this M or the rate of change multiplied by X. And then it's gonna be plus whatever that starting value is, right? So that starting value of B. Now, do we already know the rate of change? We do, so we know it's y is equal to, and we know it's gonna be two thirds multiplied by whatever the x value is. And then we're gonna be adding on some unknown value, which is our starting value, all right? So we have to see if we can figure that out. So again, pick any of these that you would like to, any pair. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is, I think this one's gonna be a pretty nice one if we use this pair of nine and 10. Again, that's a x and that's a y. Right? So let's go ahead and use that combination here. Let's change this Y value and X value to nine and 10. So Y is gonna be 10, that's equal to two thirds multiplied by X, X is gonna be nine, and we're gonna be adding on some unknown value that we have here, right? So what's two thirds of nine? Well, two thirds of nine, if you cross cancel here, is gonna be six. So it's gonna be 10 is equal to six plus something. So what does six add on to to get 10? I think that's gonna be four. All right, so let's go ahead and replace this unknown value with a four. So I think that's gonna be our starting value. All right, just for good measure, I'll do it with one more example maybe. Uh, let's try and see if this works. So if we write our equation down maybe first and say y is equal to two thirds multiplied by x, and then we can go ahead and add on this positive four. But if you wanna try maybe another combination here, let's just say that uh, X is gonna be three and Y is gonna be six. Let's say that's X and that's Y. So then this Y value here is going to be six, we're saying, right? That's equal to two thirds multiplied by X, which we're saying X is gonna be three. So it's two thirds of three. And let's see if this would end up being four, right? So if you multiply here, these threes would cross cancel, so you just get two. So six is equal to two plus something. And what does that something end up being? Well, surprise, surprise, that something is gonna be four because that's gonna be our starting value that we came up with just a moment ago. All right, so that would be our linear equation. All right, let's move on to 23 and 24. All right, for 23 and 24, we're gonna go ahead and use the linear equation that we're given. Let's go ahead and fill in the data table and then we're gonna go ahead and graph our linear equation as well. So for number uh, 23 here, let's see, we have this linear equation and it looks like we have some different X values here that we're gonna substitute in the X values to solve for the Y value, okay? So first things first, let's go ahead and take this Y and say that's equal to two thirds times and then our first X value here is going to be negative nine. So let's go ahead and plug in this negative nine and then let's go ahead and add four. All right, so now two thirds of nine is six. So two thirds of negative nine is just going to equal negative six. So this is gonna end up being negative six plus four. Negative six plus four is going to be negative two. So Y will equal negative two here, right? So that's gonna be our first order pair. We know that negative nine comma negative two is gonna be a point that's gonna be on our graph here. All right, so let's try this again. This time X is going to equal negative six. So we're going to say Y is equal to two thirds of this negative six. Let's go ahead and substitute negative six into our linear equation. So if X is negative six, let's find out the Y value. So let's see. Well, two thirds of six is going to be four. So two thirds of negative six is going to be negative four. So Y is going to be equal to negative four plus four and negative four plus four is going to equal zero. So we know that when X is equal to negative six, then Y is equal to zero. That would be another ordered pair here. So that's gonna be our Y value that goes with it. 
All right, next we can see that x is negative three. So let's go ahead and repeat the process here. So we have y is equal to two thirds of this negative three. So let's go ahead and substitute a negative three here. And then let's go ahead and add four. So what's two thirds of three? Well, two thirds of three is just going to be two. So two thirds of negative three is gonna be negative two. So we're gonna y is equal to negative two plus four. Negative two plus four is just gonna equal two. So when x is equal to negative three, it looks like y is gonna equal positive two. So that is going to be another point on our linear equation graph here. So when x is negative three, y is equal to positive two. Uh, this one's gonna be a little bit nicer. This time x is equal to zero. So we're gonna say y is equal to two thirds multiplied by zero here. So let's go ahead and substitute in zero in for x and then add four. This one's nice because two thirds times zero is just going to be zero. So it's gonna be y is equal to zero plus four. Zero plus four is just going to be four. So y would equal four here. So uh, if x is zero, then y would be four, which kind of makes sense. That's our starting value. So we can see that if we were looking at our linear equation, remember earlier we were looking for our starting value. So zero comma four would kind of be our starting value, which matches our four here. All right, let's just try one more here. It looks like uh, X is going to be positive three. So if X is positive three, we have Y is equal to two thirds multiplied by that three. And let's go ahead and add this positive four on. So two thirds of three is just going to be two. So we have Y is equal to two plus four and two plus four is gonna equal six. So in this case, we can see that when X is equal to three, Y is equal to positive six. So that's gonna be our Last ordered pair here, three comma six. Let's go ahead and fill that in in our table, all right? Now in the directions, it said that everything is gonna be going by one, so every box is worth one here. So if we go ahead and plot this negative nine, negative two, looks like we have 10 boxes in each direction, so we can plot a point in quadrant three at negative nine, negative two. And then we can plot this negative six comma zero, that's gonna be on the negative y, uh, negative x axis rather, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's right over here. And then we have this point of negative three comma positive two, that's in quadrant two. So that's gonna be over here, a negative three comma positive two. Next, we have the zero comma four, our starting value. So that's gonna be on the positive y axis right here. And then finally, we have three comma six, that's gonna be in quadrant one. So it's gonna be three to the right and then six up. Okay, so if we go ahead and draw a straight line through here, we can see this would be our linear equation. And then if you're trying to look at the rate of change aspect as well, notice how we have a vertical change of plus two each time from each point to each point. And we have a horizontal change or a change in X and it's gonna be plus three. And that kind of hopefully makes sense if you take a look at each step between each of these points. And hopefully this plus two makes sense because we are adding two as you go to the right for all of the Y values. So that's that vertical change. And then you can see that as we add three, that's going to the right that is adding three to each of the X values, which is moving to the right. So you can see that ratio of two to three, hopefully it makes sense for our rate of change, which is two thirds. All right, let's try some hypotheticals here. So let's say that X is equal to three eighths. Let's go ahead and see what's gonna happen here. So if we take our linear equation, which is Y is equal to this two thirds X plus four, let's go ahead and write that down, say Y, y is equal to two thirds x plus four, right? We're saying hypothetically, what if x is equal to three eighths? Let's go ahead and change x to three eighths here. So we have y is equal to two thirds multiplied by that three eighths. Let's go ahead and multiply or substitute that in three eighths. And then let's go ahead and add four. All right, so when multiplying fractions, we can cross cancel. The three and the three can just be one and one. And then this two and eight can cross cancel to make one and four, right? So this ends up really just being y is equal to one fourth plus four. So what's one fourth plus four? Y would just equal four and one fourth, right? So if X was equal to three eighths, then Y would be equal to four and one fourth. So if you wanted to plot another point on this graph, technically you could plot a graph of three eighths comma four and one fourth. That would be the hypothetical Y value that goes along with that X value. So I'm just gonna write it as an ordered pair, but you're okay probably just writing it as uh, Y is equal to four and one fourth like this as well. All right, let's try another hypothetical here. It says Y is equal to two thirds 
x plus 4. But in this case, we're saying that y is going to be 14. So let's go ahead and take this y is equal to 14 and substitute that in for this y value. So let's say 14 is equal to 2 thirds times something plus 4. Okay, so in this case, these are a little bit trickier, um, but we know that we don't want to have a fraction anymore. So what are some possible values of x to try? Well, we should try maybe some multiples of 3 because we'd like the fractions to cross cancel. So maybe you can think that x could possibly be something like 3 or 6 or 9 or 12, something along the lines of that, right? So we can go ahead and give some of these a try. But if we go ahead and say that it's going to be uh, 2 thirds times 3, Right. Well, two thirds of three is just going to be two and then two plus four. That's going to equal six. That's not what we want because it doesn't equal 14 that we're looking for here. If we do two thirds and then we try six uh, and then add four. Well, two thirds of six is going to be four. Four plus four is going to be equal to eight. And we're again, we're looking for 14. So that's not it either. Uh, we can try. Maybe we said that three and six don't work here. Uh, maybe just jump ahead a little bit and try something like 12. So if we try x is equal to 12, it'd be 2 thirds times 12. What's 2 thirds of 12? Well, 1 third of 12 is 4. So 2 thirds of 12 is 8. 8 plus 4 is going to be uh, 12. And so that's not what we want either. We're looking for 14. So maybe we can try another multiple of 3 here, like 15, right? Let's think about what 15 would be. So 15, if we did that one, it would be 2 thirds multiplied by 15. So what's two thirds of 15? Well, one third of 15 is five. So two thirds of 15 would be 10. 10 plus four would be 14 here. So we can see here that X would end up being equal to 15. Okay, so basically we just found out here that if x is equal to 15, then y would be equal to 14. But this is a type of problem where you would have to kind of work backwards a little bit or just kind of reason through and problem solve to figure out what that would possibly be. But I think it hopefully makes sense that we would choose maybe multiples of three, because again, if we're trying to get to 14 and there's a fraction here, we'd have to kind of multiply by something that would get rid of the fraction. And another thing to think about is if you want to do this more efficiently, you could go ahead and take away four from both sides. So we know that two thirds times something should equal 10 and you'll find out that that's going to be 15, maybe a little bit quicker as well. All right, let's try another one here. All right, in 24, we have another linear equation. This time we have y is equal to negative one half x plus nine. So if we take a look at this one, uh, we are gonna go ahead and fill in a table first. So let's see, first time up, we have x is equal to zero. So let's go ahead and say y is equal to negative one half. Let's go ahead and multiply that by zero here. Let's go ahead and substitute that in. And then we're gonna go ahead and add nine afterwards. So what's negative one half times nothing, that's still gonna be zero. So we can go ahead and say that's gonna be zero plus nine. Zero plus nine is going to be nine. So if X is equal to zero, then Y would be equal to nine. And that kind of makes sense because that's our starting value, right? So we're gonna say zero comma nine. That would be a point on our graph. So I'm actually just gonna go ahead and graph that right now while we're at it. Now, I don't think all these points are gonna fit on the graph, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and still find all the points. We really only need two points to make a graph. So let's go ahead and just put as many as we can. So now X is gonna be four. Let's go ahead and redo this process here, but this time swap out the variable. So it's Y is equal to negative one half multiplied by four this time. So we're gonna go ahead and multiply that then add nine. So What's half of four? Half of four is two. So what's negative half of four? That's just gonna be negative two. So we have negative two plus nine, and negative two plus nine is gonna equal positive seven. So we just found out that when X is equal to four, then Y will be equal to seven. That's gonna be our ordered pair. So it's gonna be four comma seven. And we can plot that as in quadrant one, go over four from the origin, then up one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. All right, so that's gonna be two points. So technically we don't have to graph anymore, but let's fit as many as we can. So now X is gonna be equal to eight. Let's go ahead and try this out. So it's gonna be Y is equal to negative one half of this eight. Let's go ahead and put eight in. 
and then let's go ahead and add nine. So what's half of eight? Well, half of eight is four. So what's negative half of eight? That's just gonna be negative four. Negative four plus nine is going to be positive five. So we're gonna say that when X is equal to eight, then Y will be equal to positive five, right? That's the relationship there. We can go ahead and put five into our table and then we have eight comma five. We can plot that in quadrant one right over here. Okay, um, so those are all the ones I think we can fit on the graph. So I'm just gonna go ahead and draw that line here just so we have it. But then I'm gonna still go ahead and do the work to figure out what the rest of these values are going to be. And so if we know that X is going to be 12 now, let's go ahead and repeat the process and say Y is gonna be equal to negative one half multiplied by this 12. Then we're gonna add on this nine afterwards. So let's go ahead and substitute that 12 in. A uh, half of 12 is six. So negative half of 12 is going to be negative six. So Y is negative six plus nine. And then negative six plus nine is going to be positive three. So that's what Y is gonna be when X is 12. So we have 12 comma three as another ordered pair. Now keep in mind, this isn't gonna fit on the graph, but that's what it would be. All right, uh, one more now X is gonna be 16. So let me just get some more space here. So Y is equal to negative one half multiplied by the 16 plus the nine. Let's go ahead and substitute in 16 in for X. So half of 16 is gonna be eight. So negative half of 16 is going to be negative eight. So we have negative eight plus nine. That's gonna equal positive one. Okay, so we know that if X is equal to 16, then Y is going to be one. And that right there is gonna be our last ordered pair that we have in our table. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in that one and we can't fit this one on the graph either, but that's okay. All right, so let's go ahead and do a couple hypotheticals now. So we have this equation of uh, y is equal to negative one half multiplied by x and then plus nine, right? That's what the, our equation was that we were just dealing with. Let me just double check. Yep, that is correct. And let's see if we can solve some of these hypotheticals. So they're saying, what is uh, Y gonna be equal if X is negative nine? So let's go ahead and plug in negative nine specifically. This is not in our table, but let's go ahead and try this, right? So let's go ahead and substitute in negative nine and then add a nine. So if we do half of nine, well, half of nine is gonna be four and a half, right? Or 4.5. And then if you do a negative times a negative, that's gonna be a positive. So this is gonna be Y is equal to four and a half. And then this is gonna be plus nine. Okay, so four and a half plus nine, that's just gonna equal 13 and a half. Feel free to use decimals if you want, but typically we use fractions in algebra. So I'm gonna to try to stick with that. So if X is equal to negative nine, if X is negative nine, then Y is 13 and a half. So that would be kind of an ordered pair to show what that hypothetical Y value would be, specifically when X is equal to negative nine. So this would be another point that would be on that graph. It wouldn't fit on there because it's past 10 and I only have 10 boxes on that graph. But if we kept going with that graph, we would eventually hit negative nine comma positive 13 and a half. All right, here's another hypothetical. This time it's gonna be the slightly trickier version because we're gonna to have to work backwards a little bit here and play around with some numbers. Um, but Y in this case is gonna be negative 36. So let's substitute that in for Y. And that's gonna be on its own on the left side. That's gonna be negative half of something plus nine. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can come up with some hypothetical values for X. So I think we're gonna to have to do an even number because we don't wanna have any fractions here. So. Um, if we choose uh, some positive numbers, let me just try something like 10 to start with here, um, and then we can go from there. So let's go ahead and try 10. Let's see, if we have negative 36, if we do negative half of 10, and then add nine. Well, what's negative half of 10? Well, half of 10 is five, so that'd be negative five plus nine. Negative five plus nine, that would be four. And this would be what, negative 36 on the left side? Well, that's just not true. So X can't equal 10. Let's try another number. Let's try something that's even bigger and see if this is in the right direction. If this is in the wrong direction, let's try going the other way, right? So let's say X is 20 here. So let's do negative 36. Let's do negative half of 20 plus nine. So what's half of 20? That's 10. So that's gonna be negative 10. So it's gonna be negative 10 plus nine. That's gonna be negative one. Does negative one equal negative 36? Uh, it doesn't, so 20 is not gonna work either. But I guess the question is, is, does it help us get closer to the direction that we want to? I think it does. 
All right, because we got an answer that's going to be closer to what we're looking for, which is that negative 36. So let's try something even bigger because we still have a ways to go here. Let's try something like, uh, I don't know, let's go with uh, 80. Okay, let's try something like 80. If we plug in 80 here, it'll be negative 36 is equal to negative one half of 80 and then plus nine. So half of 80, that's going to be 40. So what's negative half of 80? That's going to be negative 40 plus nine. So negative 40 plus nine is negative 31. Ooh, that's actually getting a lot closer to this negative 36, right? But it's still not equal. So we can't go with 80. Let's go even smaller. Let's try something like maybe, um, I don't know, something like 90. Let's see if that's any better. Uh, if we say X is 90, we can say negative 36 is equal to negative half of 90 and then plus nine. Well, let's see, half of 90 is 45. So negative half of 90 is negative 45. Negative 45 plus nine, that is exactly negative 36. So this actually works out finally. So we know X is gonna equal 90. So again, there are different ways to do this, but for these types, what we've been practicing is just coming up with some hypothetical values and testing the waters a little bit and giving it a go until we find one that does work, right? And for each of them, they're never gonna be too terrible, but you kind of have to play around with it and just kind of problem solve and think about which direction to move. And that's gonna help you get much better at understanding where these numbers come from. So uh, if we were to graph this, it would be 90 comma negative 36. This would be another point on our graph, but way, way, way off the grid of what we provided with this 10 boxes. So it would be somewhere in quadrant four, but a lot further from the origin. All right, here is question 25 through 30. Here we're gonna practice dealing with some inequalities together. All right, for 25, let's go ahead and say that an airline allows passengers to bring a luggage that cannot exceed 25 pounds. So let's go ahead and define a variable here. Let's say, let's let, um, L, I'm gonna use cursive L. Let's let L equal the weight, the weight of luggage. Okay, so we'll start with this. That's gonna represent the weight of a particular passenger's luggage. And let's see, it may not exceed 25 pounds. So that means it may be 25 pounds or less. So let's go ahead and say it's gonna be less than or equal to 25 pounds, okay? So let's go ahead and say, what could be some possible weights here? Well, we could say the luggage could weigh, here are three possibilities. It could be 25 pounds, that's fine, right? It could be 24.7 pounds. It could also be something like just three pounds. Maybe you don't have a lot to bring, but the airline company is going to be okay as long as you're under 25 pounds. All right. After that, let's go ahead and make a quick number line. So here is a number line. Uh, as you go to the left, you get smaller. As you go to the right, you go bigger. The uh, special number we're talking about here is 25 pounds. That's the threshold. And so we can go two numbers higher. Maybe you can go to 30 pounds and 35 pounds. If I go by fives, then we can go down to 20 and go down to 15. And let's see, it's allowed to equal 25 pounds. So let's do a closed circle on 25 and the airline company wants you to be under there or equal to it. So let's go to the left, all right? For 26, uh, students who practiced more than 37 math problems got an A or B on their last math test. So let's see, students who practiced more than 37 uh, math problems. So let's use maybe the variable, let's let M, uh, represent uh, the number of math problems that they did. Number of problems, all right? So if they did more than 37 problems, they seem to have done uh, better on the test if they did some more practice. So the number of problems they did is gonna be M. And so they said if they did more than 37, so we can say the inequality would be M is greater than 37, all right? So if they did more than 37 problems, then they got an A or a B. So. Uh, M could equal what? What are three possibilities? Well, they could have done 37.1 problems, or I guess they just started uh, one problem. Even if they didn't finish it, they ended up getting an A or B if they did a little more than 37. We could also have done 40 problems or something like 53 problems, right? Anything greater than 37 got them an A or B, it seems. So how do we graph these solutions? We'll just draw a number line here. To the left, we go to infinity, negative infinity. As we go to the right, we go to positive infinity. 37 is our important number here. You can go by maybe two. So I'll go to 39, then to 41. Then I'll go to 35 and 33. 
All right, so um, if they had done more than 37 problems, that's an open circle on 37, and any number of problems more than that is to the right. All right, for 27, uh, it looks like here we're saying you must be at least 35 years old before you can run for president, All right? So let's go ahead and write let um, A represent this person's age, maybe, okay, or somebody's age. So A is represent somebody's age, and their age has to be at least 35. So A is greater than or equal to 35. So you have to be 35 or older. So how old could you be? Well, we can say a couple possibilities here are you can definitely be 35 years old. You could also be 42 years old. And you could also be, I don't know, uh, 52 and a half years old. Okay, those are all okay as long as you're older than 35. So how would you graph the possible ages that you could be to run for president? Uh, well, as you go to the left, <laughs> you definitely can't be negative infinity years old here, but we're gonna put it anyway. Uh, 35 is the threshold number. I'm gonna go by threes and put 38 and 41 here. I'll go by threes and write 32 and 29. Now you can be 35 years old, so let's go ahead and fill this in. Uh, and you can also be older, you have to be older. So that's gonna be to the right. Those are older ages. All right, let's go ahead and try out 28. In this one, we say that there are certain plants that live underwater at depths greater than 68 meters. Okay, so let's go ahead and put maybe uh, a variable. Let's define and say let D represent what? Um, the depth of the plant. Okay, so the depth of the plant. All right, so if we're gonna write an inequality here, if you're going to be deeper than 68 meters underwater, then you have to be less than a specific uh, uh, depth underwater. So you have to be under 68 meters in terms of the, where this plant is going to uh, live, right? So what are some possible numbers here to kind of make this more clear? So again, 68 uh, meters underwater is represented by negative 68. So what's deeper than that? Something deeper than that would be negative uh, 70. It would be something like negative 72 or something like negative 75, right? These are all depths that are greater than uh, 68 meters underwater or negative 68. Okay. So again, we're trying to think of things that are more negative because it's deeper than that number there. So uh, on the number line, negative infinity to the left, positive infinity to the right. Uh, it has to be things that are deeper than 68 meters. So that's negative 68. Let's go by fours here. We'll do negative 64, negative 60. So this is closer to the surface or more shallow. And then deeper would be negative 72 and even deeper would be negative 76. So what are depths that are uh, greater than 68 meters? Well, depths that are greater, open circle. These are all deeper underwater than 68 meters underwater. All right, moving on, we have a couple final ones to look at. Uh, for number 29, most cell phones in 2024 will get water damage if they exceed depths of 3.25 meters. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, put a, I'll use W here and say let W equal the depth I used D last time, so I'm just mixing it up. The depth of the foam uh, so that it doesn't break. It doesn't get damaged, I'll put say. Get damaged. All right, so we wanna make sure we wanna know when it's not gonna get damaged. I guess you could write it in equality for when it does get damaged, but I'm gonna do it for when it doesn't get damaged. So it can't exceed that 3.25 meters. So let's see, this W here, Again, we're talking about things that are underwater, so we should use negative 3.25 because we're underwater. And if we don't want to exceed this uh, depth of uh, 3.25 meters, then we should be greater than or equal to this value, right? So what are numbers that are greater than or equal to? Because I think that's gonna help this make more sense because it might be a little confusing at first. Uh, but again, if it goes deeper than 3.25 meters, then it may break. So we don't really wanna go past this negative 3.25. When are also, where are also um, depths that are, it's gonna be okay? Well, we could say like negative two meters. So it's two meters underwater or a depth of two meters or like negative one. These are three options where all these numbers aren't as deep as 3.25 meters. So they should be okay underwater here, okay? Um, so how do we show this on a number line? Let's go ahead and draw a number line, negative infinity to the left, positive infinity to the right. Three, negative 3.25 is gonna go right in the middle here. 
uh, let's go by 0.25s maybe. So negative three and then negative 2.75, okay? And then as we go deeper underwater, this would be negative 3.5 and then negative 3.75. So those are going deeper underwater. So uh, we wanna have this phone be as deep as negative 3.25 or 3.25 underwater, but we don't wanna go any deeper because we don't want our phone to break, okay, or get damaged here. So let's go ahead and stay in the shallow area. All right, this last one here we have is number 30. Some clouds only form at altitudes, which is a height greater than 6,000 meters above the surface of the earth. So let's go ahead and say, let C uh, represent the uh, location, or you can say the altitude if you want, of the clouds. Okay. And then, so we're going to say this, uh, these clouds are going to form at altitudes greater than 6,000 meters. So this one's more straightforward. It's greater than 6,000. It's positive because it's in the air. So it's above the ground. Um, and so anything above 6,000 meters, these clouds are going to form. What are some possible altitudes or heights here? Uh, we could say that it could be 6,001. We could say it could be at 7,000 maybe meters above the earth, or it could be something like 7,500 meters and that would be above there all right so grabbing some possible solutions we can go ahead and say this will be negative infinity this will be positive infinity let's go ahead and put six thousand right in the middle uh, i'll just put seven thousand here and eight thousand here keep it pretty straightforward I'll put 5,000 here and 4,000 over here so uh, these clouds are going to form at altitudes of 6,000 meters or above. So let's draw an arrow to the right. All right, so there you have 30 different practice problems dealing with some equations, as well as linear equations and their relationships, as well as some inequality. So hopefully you found the video helpful. If you did, please consider giving the video a thumbs up and sharing with a classmate or friend who might also find it helpful. And as always, keep it the great work that you're already doing.